Well, good morning again, everyone. Uh, welcome to uh, the second uh, panel um, today. Uh, it's a second session on France and Prussia in the age of Napoleon. And I want to introduce my uh, dear colleague, uh, Professor Mark Gurgis of the U.S. Army Command and General Staff College, who is an esteemed historian of Napoleonic Wars and has written on the uh, British uh, cavalry and British operations in the peninsula. Uh, Dr. Gurgis, please take over. Okay, thank you, Alex. Let me get my video started again. All right, good. Uh, thank you. Good morning, everybody. Uh, it's my pleasure today to uh, introduce the next uh, session. We have three um, very interesting uh, panelists, and I will do is I, I will introduce each one um, as um, they start. And we'll start with Dr. Charles White this morning. He was a historian with the U.S. Army uh, for over 33 years, retiring in 2019. After earning his doctorate in history from Duke University, he served as the chief of military history at the United States Army Infantry School at Fort Benning, Georgia, then as a command historian for the 21st Theater Army Area Command in Germany. Following these assignments, Dr. White served as the Army's Lewis and Clark uh, historian during the bicentennial commemoration of that uh, expedition. He then became the command historian for the United States Army Forces Command at Fort Bragg, North Carolina. He's the author of many works, including The Enlightened Soldier Scharnhorst and the Military Gosh, uh, Gestaft in Berlin, 1801 to 1806, the U.S. Army and the U.S. The Lewis and Clark Expedition, and Scharnhorst, the formative years, as well as many papers and articles on American and German military history. Uh, today, uh, Charles will be talking about Timeless Wisdom, Scharnhorst, and his handbook, uh, Der Artillery, or Den Artillery. Uh, Chuck, I'll turn it over to you. Okay. Can you hear me? Yes, we can. Okay, good. <laughs> I know. Um, technology challenged here a little bit. Let me see if I can get my screen up here a little better. All right. Today I'm going to talk about Sharon Horse's handbook on the artillery and some of the timeless wisdom that uh, I believe uh, comes from that book. His first volume was published on the first day of summer in 1804 and contains about 600 pages, including numerous tables, charts, and drawings. You know, then the next volume came out in 1806 and was about 800 pages. And then the third one came out after his death in 1814, which is about 700 pages. The first and second volumes deal with the organization and uh, characteristics of the artillery along with the theory and practice of it. The third covers field operations. And in this volume, Scharnhorst was attempting to uh, enlighten his readers on the use of artillery in so-called combined arms operations. Before that time, only the infantry and the cavalry were considered working together as a combined arms team and the artillery is usually left by the side. And this was particularly true in the Prussian army, especially under Frederick the Great. I'm gonna cover three themes here that I think are important. And I'm gonna to try to use Scharnhorst's words as much as possible in doing this. The first major theme is the concept of building. Now building was a process of development or perfectibility through the individual's character and, in, and intellect through education and training. It's a lifelong process. And Scharnhorst was one of the first German intellectuals of his time to apply this process to mechanisms, specifically the artillery. And basically he felt that in order to obtain perfectibility in the artillery, you have to have theory, first of all, and then through the process of experimentation, artillery is continually perfected. And of course, no model he felt is, is feasible in and of itself. It has to be continually tested through experimentation. And then 
he observed that often innovations and innovation and invention seem so plausible, as he said, uh, when they're first introduced. Of course, we hear that all the time, every day on the on the news here with new phones and everything else. But unless they're tested on a large scale to prove their applicability, they're worthless. And so he said that we have to apply this process of building through mechanisms. And he, what he's talking about is what we refer to today, the scientific method. First, you have the invention, and then you start proofing that invention through experiments, and you continually perfect the invention as it goes along. And he said that this is a gradual step-by-step -step process in order to do that. And he relates this very closely to human development. You know, we have to learn how to walk before we run, so to speak. And so he said, you have to do the same thing with technology. And he said, without theory and practice, you know, it would become impossible for us, quote, to distinguish the true from the false. Then we would be like a person without any personal judgment of his own who imitates everybody. And he goes back and forth. You know, first he imitates this person, then he imitates that person. Soon he declares himself for this idea, then for that idea. And, you know, the, the guy is just a wandering nomad, so to speak. And so Sharnor sees technology as a challenge and response problem. It's not the one who gets the technology first, it's the one who uses it first and best. And of course, he also made it an, an, an important statement here that technology often outraces the society's ability to adapt. We've seen this so many times, particularly in warfare. And so he advises readers, especially, especially the younger readers, that before they go into books two and three in this first volume, which talks about the development of the artillery, they first have to understand and grasp the scientific method. Otherwise, they're just going to be floundering around as they read and not really know what's going on. And so the second important theme running in book one, which I found very interesting and later German historians found the same thing, was Scharnhorst's um, presentation of the internal conditions of the Prussian artillery corps. Remember that he was brought to Prussia so that he could help improve the Prussian artillery corps. But when he arrived there and uh, July of 1801, excuse me, May of 1801, he found competing uh, factions in the thing. Tempelhof was supposed to be the artillery regimental commander, but this elderly 88-year-old General uh, Merfax was actually the chef de artillery, as they called him, the honorary colonel of the artillery. And his son-in-law, who was a uh, 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 you know, a real insider and stuff and knew a lot of other people, basically ran the artillery and kept Tempelhof out. And so there was a lot of infighting in the artillery. And this comes out here in, in uh, the handbook, the artillery, which he talks about here. He said, Un only under favorable circumstances can one expect impartial promotion in the artillery corps. It will always depend on uh, nepotism and favoritism. And he goes on to talk about uh, in the, he said, you can find this so readily in the infantry and the cavalry. You know, he says, uh, people distinguished by knowledge, you know, are, are not even um, recognized. And of course, Cloudsmith said this, that a lot of people uh, felt that Shiners was a, a book learner and stuff. And even their Napoleon secret police uh, labeled him a professor from Gerdington, where he had studied uh, 30 years earlier. 
And so they even got it wrong. But it's, he said that, uh, here's an interesting quote here, the most devoted and patriotic minded men find themselves in an embarrassing situation here. No, even if they can help their friends and neighbors, they are often demanded, it's demanded from them that they reciprocate back and forth favors in the thing. People get promoted in the cavalry and infantry uh, only by connection. Neither ability nor achieved knowledge is even considered. And then he says that very few people in the army, the Prussian army, they have any knowledge be die, uh, besides a simple edu edu education. They can basically read and write, and that's not really true that much in uh, the infantry and the cavalry, especially the cavalry, he says. According to later Prussian historian, Kalmar von der Goetz, who edited the first edition of Scharnhorst's writings in 1881, book one, quote, clearly shows a great openness and frankness with this Scharnhorst wrote, or better said, was allowed to write, for he always ca calculated the circumstances wisely. I'm not sure that's true here because uh, a lot of people, when they read this book or this section of the book, were not really pleased with Sharnhorst. But the king always seemed uh, to like him because of his knowledge of uh, scientific knowledge and, and learning and stuff. And so he continually sought Sharnhorst advice on a lot of things, whether or not he took it or not. That's a different story, but he, but he always... Uh, invited Sharnor to submit memorandum and other things for the, uh, the improvement of the artillery as well as the Prussian army. And But Gold says, for those living today in 1881, this seems downright astonishing. It is, therefore gives the book an, a, a unique value for the special study of this epic. As Sharnor pointed out, Nepotism and seniority, not town and ability, ruled the Prussian officer corps before 1806. The third topic is, science, is Scharnhorst's scientific analysis. Later people refer back to Scharnhorst's studies and stuff as, uh, as, as someone way ahead of his time. Particularly, he himself lamented the fact that uh, artillery gunnery exercises were not consistent nor uh, sufficient enough to determine the best use of cannons. And this is where he talks about in book three, um, when he talks about how, you know, it's probably was because of money. And of course the artillery was the most neglected branch in the Prussian army, but there were never enough opportunities to uh, practice with the guns. And one of the things Scharnhorst did was to circumvent uh, these, uh, the artillery corps restrictions on firing. He persuaded the king to allow students at the Berlin Institute for Young Officers, which he took over in 1801 and reformed its curriculum. And the king even devoted a, uh, a room in, in the royal palace as a classroom. And the king often came and watched uh, these classes and, stuff and was really, thrilled about this. And he also came once when Charnos invited him to the uh, artillery ranges to watch these students, particularly the ones from the cavalry and the infantry, learn how to fire cannons. And he used a lot of these gunnery exercises here with the students to formulate uh, his theories on projectiles and firing mechanisms and things of, of this nature. And of course, his techniques later anticipated, or his results, I should say, later anticipated Friedrich Gauss's uh, least famous least square method that Gauss published in 1809. 
Interestingly, a mathematics professor, Theodore Schmidt from Duke University uh, in the 1950s wrote an interesting examination of, of Scharnhorst's tests and their results. I tried to find Schmidt when I was at Duke, but he had since passed away and uh, the math department didn't know where his papers were or anything. Uh, they obviously didn't keep them. And, uh, but anyway, Schmidt had a number of conclusions that uh, he said, he said that uh, first Scharnhorst series of measurements closely follows Gauss's normal distribution. Second, the series of numbers Scharnhorst achieved is an attractive example of the careful execution of an experiment. And he goes on to say that Scharnhorst and, and fight in um, conducting the experiments, he had over 200 uh, examples there of firing things here and came uh, close to exactly what Gauss came up with in 1809. Scharnhorst did through experimentations and then uh, table math mathematics. And you can find this in his uh, handbook on officers there, there's a, not handbook for officers, officer, handbook on the artillery. There's a table there which describes all this thing. And it's, it's like doing all this stuff without a calculator. He had to do it all hand by hand and he put all the things in there and then he divided the things and you can see all is uh, what we would call uh, a statistical analysis today. Uh, and as Professor Schmidt said, this is just remarkable in that time because uh, a lot of this stuff was done before 1804 that would think because there's a lot of stuff, a lot of notation from his experience with the Hanover in artillery school, which he was in uh, 30 years earlier. And he tried to do a lot of this stuff there. Um, and, he, and Gal says that Scharnhorst techniques, when you look at them uh, closely, that it wasn't until 1909 uh, that a lot of his statistical analysis was proven correct. So, you know, looking back 200 years, Scharnhorst assumptions were correct in both the theory and practice of artillery gunnery in those times. And I'm being told that uh, I'm giving the white flag or the red flag to close this off here. So looking back over the last two centuries, his handbook on the artillery presents an interesting snapshot of the timeless wisdom of Scharnhorst. The first volume synthesizes his concept of building as it applies to human beings and mechanical devices. In both cases, Scharnhorst believed both were continually were capable of continuous improvement through education and training in the case of human beings and theory and practice in the case of mechanical devices. Most other intellectuals at the time never wrote about any of this stuff. And then when he applied his ideas in a practical way, he anticipated the results German mathematician Peter Gauss introduced in 1809. And this clearly, in my opinion, marks him as a true child of the enlightenment, fully engaged in the intellectual, scientific, and cultural events of his time, as well as its political and military uh, conflicts. As Clausewitz later wrote, Scharnor seemed to people of the outside world and even to the intelligent part of it, a dull, saving, and pendant, while military men took him for an irresolute, impractical, unsoldierly book writer. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Chuck. I appreciate it. We're gonna shift now to Ethan Sochek, who's a PhD student, teaching assistant and student fellow in the Military History Center at the University of North Texas in Denton. Uh, he entered his Bachelor's of Arts in History and Classical Civilizations uh, from Bennett College in uh, Wisconsin and his master's in European history from the University of North Texas. 
Um, he's worked in his main interest is early modern Napoleonic and Germany uh, military history. His master's thesis was entitled Testing the Narrative of Prussian Decline, 1778 to 1806. Uh, and he examines the Prussian army during the French Revolutionary Wars. Um, his thesis seeks to challenge the traditional interpretation of the Prussian army as a force of decline before the defeat during the War of the Fourth Coalition. Ethan is currently working on his PhD under Dr. Michael Jerry, studying the Prussian King Frederick the, uh, Wilhelm uh, III's war leadership during the Napoleonic period. Um, his presentation today uh, is going to be entitled Prussian Mobilization in 1813 in the Improvisation of the Land Bear. Ethan? Okay. Can everyone hear me well? You sound good. Go ahead. Okay. So, the failure of Napoleon's 1812 invasion of Russia created an unexpected opportunity for the nations of Europe to break his hold over the continent and sparked the War of the Sixth Coalition. The Prussian king, Frederick William III, hesitated to join the Russian war against the French. However, General uh, Ludwig von York, commander of most of the Prussian field army, joined the Russians without royal approval and brought the, Pruss uh, the Prussian province of East Prussia with him, resulting in Prussia's entry into the war. Because of its unexpected and reluctant entry into the War of the Sixth Coalition, the Prussian army was far too small for war in 1813. Therefore, the Prussians created a land there or militia to meet their manpower requirements. <laughs> While the Prussian reform movement had reshaped most other aspects of the Prussian army since its last defeat at the Battle of Jena in 1806, no plan for a Prussian land bear had yet been adopted. As such, the land bear adopted in 1813 was an improvised uh, as an emergency measure. The reform faction in Prussia viewed the land bear as an embodiment of a nation in arms and the key to fighting a national war. Most historians have also followed the log, uh, this logic, arguing that the creation of the land bear represented an embrace of this new type of war. Most historians of Prussia see the creation of the land bear as part of the reform movement of the revolutionary era. The Prussian reform movement sought to modernize the Prussian army in response to the changes in warfare introduced by the French Revolution. The reformers endeavored to transform the Prussian army at every level and largely succeeded by 1812. As part of this effort, the reformers attempted to introduce a national army based on some form of universal service. However, these efforts all failed due to the resistance from the king and other conservatives. The land bear was not created until 1813 as Prussia faced war with Napoleon and needed manpower desperately. It was created as an emergency measure by a provincial assembly. In effect, the land bear of 1813 was largely unrelated to the reform movement and greatly different, uh, differed from many of the ideas of the reformers. First, the land bear was intended for conventional war, not guerrilla or partisan war. Second, it retained some exemptions from uh, service. And third, it was brigaded and fought with a professional army rather than independently. Fourth, the creation of the East Prussian land bear forced the reformers to abandon their previous defense plans. This proves that the Prussian land bear was adopted out of necessity rather than as a long-term commitment to this new idea of warfare. The idea of a national army or militia based on universal service existed even before the Prussian defeats at the twin battles of Jena and Auerstedt in 1806. After the war of the fourth coalition, the Prussian army reform commission led by General Gerhard von Scharnhorst suggested several plans for universal service. However, the king resisted instituting them. The king and many traditional minded Prussians feared that created a creating a national army would raise the status of the common soldiers and threaten the Prussian social order. They believed that to arm the common people en masse would make them political actors and entitle them to some role in government. Many reformers agreed with this idea and argued that defeating the French demanded social reforms in addition to military reforms. These fears prevented the Prussians from adopting a plan for universal service before the outbreak of war in 1813. However, at the time of the convention of Taurogen, the Prussians possessed only 65,000 trained men in the entire kingdom. As such, the East Prussian estates adopted a new law to create a land bear to generate the military manpower necessary to drive the French from their province. The first draft of this, uh, the concept for the East Prussian land bear was written by York with the aid of Karl von Clausewitz, a former Prussian officer, then serving as a staff officer with the Russian army. York submitted this plan to Alexander Duhan, chairman of the provincial committee of the estates, who altered it before presenting it to the estates, which passed it into law. The alterations to the draft reveal much about the nature of the land bear. 
The differences between the two drafts proved that the East Prussian Landwehr was adopted as a military necessity and not a commitment to a nation in arms. York's draft for the Landwehr represented the idea of a national army that the reformers had striven for throughout the entire revolutionary period. This plan aimed to create a true nation in arms along the French model of 1793. Given Napoleon's unparalleled victories and conquests until 1812, most Prussian reformers now believed that only a full mobilization of the nation could defeat the French. In this plan, York and Clausewitz sought to mobilize and arm the entire military potential of East Prussia. In particular, they expressly prohibited any exemptions from service or the hiring of replacements. No more exemptions for religious or ethnic subsessions of society. All subjects must fight to defend the nation. By the same token, the wealthy could not buy substitutes as had traditionally been allowed. York and Clausewitz argued that to create a true uprising of the nation, all classes must equally bear the burden of combat. While this measure was intended to raise the manpower necessary to fight a modern war against Napoleon, its writers believed it would achieve more. To fight a national war with a citizen army, the um, Prussian officers thought that they needed to create an upswelling of patriotic sentiment. A national army was critical not just to manpower, but because it would provide the Prussians the moral power of a nation in arms. As commander of the Prussian field forces, York presented this plan to former Prussian minister Alexander Duhon. Duhon made several alterations to York's proposal before submitting it to the states, to the estates. His first change was to introduce a few exemptions to service in the land bear for the clergy and other interest groups, and to allow for the hiring of replacements. More importantly, it prevented the deployment of the land bear outside the borders of East Prussia without the consent of the provincial estates. Moreover, Duhon's law also included only infantry from uh, in the land bear, no cavalry or artillery. Duhon's proposal was submitted to the East Prussian estates on February 5th, 1813, and was adopted unchanged two days later. The two key differences between New York and Clausewitz's draft and the final law as written by Duhon were the weakening of the principle of universal service and the removal of the land bear cavalry. The first, and most, uh, the first was the most frustrating to reformers as they believed it most undermined their dreams of a national army. To them, exemptions and substitutions prevented military service from becoming truly the responsibility of all subjects and thus prevented the state from creating a nation in arms. This risked a failure to harness the full military power of the nation and could damage both the morale of the Prussian armies and the commitment of the state to war. Furthermore, the removal of the cavalry from the land bear both limited its role and potential effects. Without cavalry, the land bear would be far less able to act as an independent force as Scharnhorst and many others believed critical. In addition, the restrictions to the land bear of acting, of being unable to act outside of East Prussia clearly challenged the idea of the land bear as a national force and weakened the concept of a national war effort. More practically, such a restriction would make committing and maneuvering the Prussian army incredibly difficult and greatly reduce its manpower. To fight and win a modern war, the entire Prussian army must be able to follow the enemy wherever they go. It is likely that York believed that once fighting began, this restriction could be ignored or lifted. Overall, Duhan's changes to the land bear suited it to fight a far more traditional war than the original draft by the Prussian officers. This demonstrates that the, Prussian, that the East Prussian land bear as a measure of political necessity implemented by these states rather than as a commitment to a new idea of war. The actions of York and East of uh, York and the East Prussian estates placed great pressure on the king and the rest of the Prussian government to join the Russians in their war against Napoleon. Frederick William remained outwardly committed to a French alliance throughout December. He doubted the Prussian ability to defeat the French without Austrian aid and feared that Prussia could not survive another defeat by Napoleon. However, most of the reformers argued that this was the Prussians' only chance to defeat Napoleon after he had been weakened by his disastrous retreat from Moscow. Over the winter, the king gradually came to the conclusion that he now must fight the French in order to survive. He recalled Scharnhorst from his forced retirement and issued a call for volunteers. However, concerns over French troops in the Western provinces of Prussia caused the king to hesitate to fully commit to the Russian alliance. Not until the end of February did the king full, finally resolve to fight Napoleon and approve York's actions. This now faced the Prussian government with the need to rapidly raise an army to fight the French. Scharnhorst began working on a plan for a national land bear before the king accepted the East Prussian estates law. The differences between the two versions of the land bear reveal much of the differences of the kind of army the reformers had envisioned and the one formed by the East Prussian estates. Scharnhorst's first defense plan envisioned creating 
uh, increasing the size of the mobile army to 100,000 men. In addition, Scharnhorst advocated the creation of a national land bear to act as an auxiliary to the mobile army. Given the weakness, um, given the weakened state of the Russian army after the 1812 campaign and the Austrians' failure to join the Spring Alliance against Napoleon, Scharnhorst feared that the defeat of the field army in battle was very likely. Based on the example of the Spanish resistance to the French, he believed that a strong and patriotic land bear conducting primarily guerrilla operations would allow the Prussians to survive defeats by Napoleon. In addition, he mistrusted the commitment of the king and his advisors to war and believed that a national war of resistance could compensate for this lack of royal will. To create a land bear capable of waging this kind of war, Scharnhorst asserted that all um, military exemptions to service in the Canton laws must be eliminated. This demand implies that he intended to use the existing Prussian Canton system, uh, system of recruitment to create the land bear. Scharnhorst argued that the equipment for the increase of the regular army could be seized from French arsenal, arsenals and deserters within Prussia. In addition, he consent, contended that the British could provide both the money and weapons to sustain this kind of war for years to come. As this plan implies, Scharnhorst anticipated fighting a very different kind of war against Napoleon than the Prussians had in 1806 or would in 1813 through 14. He seems to believe that Prussia was too weak to confront Napoleon and a pitched battle, even with Russian aid. Moreover, even if the Prussians and Russians could raise enough men to match the French army, no allied commander had proven themselves capable of rivaling Napoleon's mastery of the operational art. Facing this prospect, the Spanish model of resistance offered an appealing alternative to direct battle with the French. The Prussian land bear could bog down the French army, threaten its supply lines, and gradually weaken their numbers. This would allow the Prussians and Russian uh, armies to endure defeats and reform with British money and supplies. This, the combined effort of regular and guerrilla armies uh, resistance proved effective in Spain and Scharnhorst hoped that a Prussian land bear could enable the Prussians to fight in a similar way. Scharnhorst's first plan reveals that in 1813, the reformers had wanted to fight a national war of resistance in which the land bear would fight a guerrilla war in support of the professional army. The reformers developed this concept in the years before 1813 and it fit well into their idea of a nation in arms. However, events soon forced Scharnhorst to rethink his defense plan and the role of the land bear within it. The land bear law adopted by the East Prussian estates required him to completely change his draft for the land bear. Scharnhorst was surprised by the speed and ease with which the East Prussian estates began creating the land bear in February of 1813, and this may have revised his opinion of the kind of war that the Prussians were willing and able to fight. However, he detested several provisions of the East Prussian law. In Scharnhorst's mind, the greatest problem with Duhan's law was the provision that its forces could not be employed beyond the borders of East Prussia. On a practical level, this provision would make the land bear far less valuable as a military force, given that much of the fighting was likely to take place west of the Vistula, the western border of East Prussia. If this were applied to all provinces, it would greatly reduce the manpower available to the Prussians and render them incapable of matching the French army. In more abstract terms, the limitation of the, of the land bear to its home province undermined both national patriotism and the principle of universal military obligation. In addition, Scharnhorst opposed the existence of substitutes and exemptions in the East Prussian land bear on similar grounds. Scharnhorst had already committed himself and the government to the principle of universal service in the decree regarding conscription in the regular army. He considered it to be vitally important to create a nation in arms and fight the national war that he and other reformers had envisioned. Finally, Scharnhorst believed that Landwehr cavalry would be necessary to raise enough horsemen for the Prussian army. Before leading for the leaving for the field army, Scharnhorst wrote a draft for the Landwehr for all of Prussia. He based its organization on the East Prussian model with some important alterations. First, he removed the stipulation that the Landwehr could only be deployed within the borders of its home province. This was the only one of Scharnhorst's changes that was applied to the East Prussian land bear. Otherwise, East Prussia, which had already begun raising its land bear, was allowed to retain the organization approved by the East Prussian estates. While Scharnhorst opposed the idea of exemptions and substitutions, he begrudgingly accepted them in the case of East, East Prussia. The ordinance for the national land bear was signed by the king and, and enforced uniformly across all the other provinces of Prussia. The national land bear allowed no buying of substitutions and only allowed uh, small exemptions for the clergy. In all other respects, the national land bear adopted the East Prussian model. This draft was adopted by the king with few changes on 17 March, 1813. The changes Scharnhorst made to the East Prussian land bear reveal much about his understanding of the needs of modern war. Scharnhorst, Scharnhorst's commitment to the principle of universal service once again demonstrated the importance that he placed on the idea of a nation in arms. 
He viewed this method for the, um, he viewed this as a method for the Prussians to overcome their disadvantages in resources and manpower compared to the French. Moreover, he believed that a national army would increase the morale of a, the regular army and strengthen the resolve of the Prussian state and give it the moral power of fighting a national war. In addition, the cavalry and our, um, the addition of cavalry and artillery to the Landwehr helped to increase the size of these two arms. However, it also enabled the Landwehr to deploy combined arms brigades without reliance on the regular army. This opened up the Landwehr, the possibility of Landwehr units employing the new combined arm tactics of the reformed Prussian army independent of the line army. While this change was subtle, it implied a greater reliance on the land bear for combat operations than previous plans, which all envisioned it acting as an auxiliary force. Scharnhorst had argued for the importance of a national militia independent of the regular army for his entire life, and it, seemed uh, it seems likely that he intended for the land bear to serve separately from the regular army. Overall, Scharnhorst's second draft for the land bear imagined it fighting a far more conventional war based on pitched battles than his first draft. The changes between the two drafts demonstrate that the 1813 land, uh, Landwehr differed in important ways from Scharnhorst's idea of a national army. More importantly, it was designed and trained to fight a different war than the reformers had intended to fight. As such, it was a creation of necessity rather than a commitment to the reformers idea of national war. The difficulty of creating a Landwehr reveals much about the thinking of Prussian officers and statesmen. Universal service was the only major reform of the Prussian army that had not been implemented by the beginning of 1813. The Reglement of 1812 adopted the tactical reforms of the assault column and deploying line troops as skirmishers. The Prussian army adopted a new general staff system before the 1806 campaign and shortly afterwards reformed the Prussian officer education system. In 1808, the Prussian army adopted combined arms corps and converted to the French operational art of war. However, the king and other officers, such as York, rejected the idea of a nation in arms until the outbreak of war in 1813. The major difference was that the earlier reforms, unlike the Landwehr, could be understood as purely military. They could be implemented without any changes to the Prussian social order. However, both reformers and conservatives believed that universal service and a national army would require making the common subjects political actors. They believe that to create a nation in arms, they must make the common Prussians citizens with rights as well as subjects. This caused the king to resist adopting universal service until he was forced to by the necessities of war. In the short term, it appears that these fears were unfounded. After the defeat of, the Napole of Napoleon, the Landwehr was subordinated to the regular army and no constitution or rights were issued to the Prussian people. This term proves that the king did not view the creation of the Landwehr as a commitment to the idea of a nation in arms. Uh, that's it, thank you. Okay, thank you, Ethan. Uh, our third presenter today uh, will be uh, Haley Stewart. Haley is a doctoral candidate at the University of North Texas. She received her uh, uh, Bachelor's of Arts in uh, History at Southeastern Oklahoma State University and her Master's of Arts in History at the University of North Texas. Her dissertation is entitled Provincial Hanover, Anglo-French Emity and the po British Policy in North Germany, 1800 to 1806, uh, which examines Hanover's role in the British North German policy within the British uh, and continental perspectives. Her paper today is entitled A Consequence of British Actions, the French Invasion of Hanover in 1803. Haley. Thank you. In 1803, Anglo-French disagreements over the fulfillment of the Treaty of Amiens, primarily related to Malta, prompted the deterioration of Anglo-French relations. Napoleon Bonaparte viewed the invasion of Hanover as an attack on Britain, which Britain understood even though they declined to protect the electorate. In early March 1803, General Giraud Duroc's mission to Berlin included the French announcement of the intention to invade Hanover. Attacking Hanover, a move that Christian von Hogwitz, the Prussian foreign minister, acknowledged as the consequence of British actions, which meant repercussions for Germany. Hogwitz made the same point to both the Hanoverian and British ministers when Hanover encountered threats in 1801. While Hogwitz argued that the Anglo-Hanoverian connection was abstract, he maintained that the opinion of Hanover as a British province still existed. The contention over Hanover as a British province reemerged in 1803. Although George III's Hanoverian representatives, such as Frederick von Decken, attempted to convince Prussia to intervene on Hanover's behalf, Britain failed to act to stop the French invasion. 
Regardless of Britain's insistence that Hanover remained independent, French and Prussian behavior indicated otherwise, not to mention Britain's own actions undermine their own public policy positions. The decision, for example, to evacuate Hanoverian troops and establish the King's German Legion de demonstrated Britain's ill-defined Hanoverian policy. If Hanover truly represented a separate entity, then the British would have permanently abandoned the elector. In early March, 1803, Lucassini, uh, the Prussian envoy in Paris, alerted Berlin to France's response to George III's address to parliament that had arrived in Paris. Talleyrand informed Lucassini of British military preparations in response to Anglo-French disagreements regarding Malta and British fears of French intentions to reoccupy Egypt. Moreover, he shared that Bonaparte intended to respond to any increase in British forces with increased troops in Friesland to attack the electorate of Hanover. These events, Lucassini wrote to Berlin, prompted Bonaparte to send General Duroc to Berlin with orders to make an urgent appeal to Prussia in case war erupted with Britain. In his 22 March dispatch, dispatch Francis Jackson, who's the ambassador, uh, the British ambassador to Berlin, informed the French or the British uh, Foreign Minister Hawkesbury that Duroc had arrived in Berlin. Based on news and circulation, Duroc's mission concerned British preparations for war. Political gossip split along factional lines, with those tending to support Britain, blaming the resumption of conflict on, quote, the offensive irritability and destructive ambition of the first consul, while those who aligned themselves with France blamed Britain for failing to adhere to the Treaty of Amiens. The key themes from various intelligence reports that Jackson emphasized included France dismissing a Prussian occupation of Hanover as an option, Prussia's commitment to maintaining peace, and Jackson's expectation that of Prussia adopting a strategy of delaying committing to an official position. While Jackson maintained confidence in Prussia avoiding an alliance with France, Duroc's record of, Berlin, of his Berlin assignment stressed Prussian agreement with France and strained Anglo-Prussian relations. In a meeting with Hogwitz, Duroc seized the opportunity to communicate French complaints, explicitly Britain's failure to comply with the terms of Amiens, regarding Malta with British insistence of retaining control of a garrison. While Bonaparte wished to maintain peace, Duroc noted, ignoring British abuses proved impossible, which meant the likelihood of war. Hoggett's predictably concurred with French grievances, indicated, indicated his desire that Prussia remain partner with France, and, and, and expressed that the issuance of subsidies, raising the militia, and reports from the press all suggested Britain's proclivity for conflict. To Duroc, Anglo-Prussian relations appeared fractured, evidenced by Jackson's lack of instructions from London on Anglo-French disagreements. The commercial ramification of, ramifications of an occupation of Hanover served as a major topic of Duroc and Hogwitz's discussion. If the, threat of an, if, the, if the threat of a French invasion of Hanover failed to deter British support for war, Hogwitz struts Frederick William's resolve to adhere to strict maritime neutrality in particular to the stipulations from the armed neutrality of 1781 regarding search and seizure of neutral ships. War, Hogwitz emphasized, threatened Prussian commerce, which proves critical to Franco-Prussian trade. He remarked that once France occupied Hanover, Britain undoubtedly planned to blockade the ports of Hamburg and Bremen, which contained most Prussian ships. Britain retaining Ma Malta, Duroc responded, still meant war, despite any methods of pre prevention that Hogwitz put forth. Hodvix, in a letter to Lucassini, addressed the French attack on Hanover, for which he blamed British actions and the ramifications for Prussian trade. He realized that once France possessed Hanover, Britain had license to target Prussian ships. In addition, Britain would prevent trade in the ports of Hamburg, Bremen, and the Baltic to block French access to supplies resulting in Prussia's inability to supply Northern Europe. British actions, Hogwitz declared, aided their own commerce, which meant the search and seizure of European shipping. Considering these factors, he's planned to confer with Britain about observing maritime neutrality rules from 1781 in order to secure Prussian commercial neutrality. While Hogwitz hoped Britain agreed to terms with Prussia, he noted Britain's consistence in refusing an arrangement that they viewed as weakening British naval supremacy. Declining Prussia's commercial offer for, meant for Britain the loss of Hanover increased animosity from continental Europe. In early April 1803, Jackson briefed London on Prussian attitudes toward the Anglo-French conflict and French threats to Hanover. To stop the reemergence of Anglo-French hostilities, 
Hogwitz had sent Baron Jacobi Close, Prussian envoy in London, instructions to speak with the British ministry about securing Hanover. He shared with Jackson that Duroc notified Prussia that France had planned to invade Hanover in the event of war, to which Frederick William expressed the intention to adhere to a rigorous territorial and maritime neutrality. Hoggitz further explained that Prussia's motivations to avoid the resumption of war concerned trade and Jacobi's instructions concerned an Anglo-Prussian commercial agreement. Prussian anxiety about the security of commercial activity resulted in further efforts to engage Jackson on the subject in Berlin. Karl August, August von Strunzi, Prussian finance minister, approached Jackson and informed him of Prussia's hope to, quote, take advantage of the present circumstances in order to render their commercial navigation secure in case of a maritime war. Strunzi conveyed his belief in the inevitability of Anglo-French hostilities and expressed irritation that it meant repercussions for Germany. Strunzi suggested terms that were similar to the terms that Russia and Denmark had agreed to with the British in order to eliminate French pretenses to recruit Prussia as an ally. While he realized British strategy involved attacking trade to thwart French acquisition of naval stores and other items the British deemed contraband, he emphasized the necessity of quote, ports should be, the necessity that quote, ports should be free and uninterrupted. If conflict erupted, Jackson responded, Britain's ability to search and seize the ships of neutral powers to prevent them from supplying France proved essential to British success. Strunzi answered that he favored a treaty that specified the provisions regarding the inspection and confiscation of goods from neutral ships that protected both the British and the Prussians. Although Jackson assumed Prussia worked to convince France to safeguard German neutrality, he suspected Prussia's awareness of the commercial repercussions of a disagreement with Britain furthered their desperations to secure an arrangement. And he thought that this kind of this uh, desperation was something that only benefited the British. In early May, Hogwitz told Jackson, who continued to wait for orders from London, that he had received return communications from Jacobi. Although he understood British caution in providing the reason for Britain maintaining Malta, remaining in Malta, he conveyed his dissatisfaction with Britain's refusal to support an Anglo-Prussian trade agreement. Even though Jacobi's dispatch signified a lack of British interest in a commercial treaty, Hogwitz remained confident that Jackson would receive orders from London. Hogwitz did worry, however, that a British response would, quote, come too late to prevent the French in case of war from occupying the electorate of Hanover and shutting the ports of the north of Germany. On 6 May, Prince Adolphus, who was in Hanover, informed George III that Frederick von Decken had departed, had departed Hanover for Berlin to discuss Prussian plans related to the French threats to North Germany. Adolphus commented that it, quote, appears to me totally impossible for the King of Prussia to allow the French to occupy your majesty's dominions as long as he wishes to preserve his own. For at a moment's notice, they can march into the heart of the Prussian country without the smallest difficulty. Jackson also informed London of Deccan's, Deccan's arrival at Potsdam on 10 May. Deccan told Jackson that he intended to discover Prussian plans related to the possible French seizure of Hanover, with the hope that Prussia might intervene to prevent an invasion. Additionally, he wanted to discuss the alternative of arranging a surrender that caused the least harm to the electorate in case of war. Jackson briefed Deccan on Prussian attitudes toward the French threat, particularly commercial neutrality concerns. He noted Deccan's inability to speak with Frederick William about Hanover and expected the Hanoverian diplomat to only have the opportunity to deliver Adolphus's message. Jackson blamed Frederick William's limited focus on the dangers Anglo-French hostilities posed for Prussia for Deccan's struggles to speak with the king about the electorate. He believed Deccan's optimism that Prussia might assist in the defense of Hanover naive. French strategy, Jackson believed, endeavored to counteract Britain's naval advantage with an occupation of the electorate to cut off British access to European ports. He situated Prussia within French strategy, emphasizing that Prussia viewed the sustained losses, quote, to be e nearly equal to that which must ensue to Great Britain. He criticized Prussian efforts to avoid the consequence of the French in North Germany, specifically the Prussian expectation of Britain altering rules of search and seizure for Prussian neutral ships and, a, and, and the Russians adopting a stronger stance on North Germany. Prussia's failure to secure alliances with Britain and Russia, according to Jackson, meant that Prussia was left alone. 
While Prussia refrained from following a policy of open resistance to France, he remained uncertain whether this decision resulted from Frederick William or the influence of others. In mid-May, Jackson received reports that France planned to use Prussian ships to procure smuggled goods. Strunzi disavowed such a scheme and assured Jackson that Prussia recognized Britain's authority to search ships trading with powers hostile to Britain for illicit goods. Regardless, he argued against British compensation of legal goods and that it meant the seizure of Prussian property. Jackson suggested to Hawkesbury that Britain work to convince Prussia of the advantages of preventing the French from entering North Germany if they wish to secure com commerce. Based on the reaction in Berlin to Jacobi's efforts in London, Jackson ascertained that the unfavorable status of Anglo-Prussian relations re and, and, and reminded Hawkesbury again of, quote, the immense importations that the British bring through the Elbe, Elbe and the Vesse. On 24 May, Jackson alerted the British ministry that the news of Lord Whitworth's retirement from Paris had reached Berlin. The dissolution of Anglo-French negotiations prompted intense debate between Frederick William and his advisors, to which the king um, had, quote, not yielded to the representations which have been made to him on the necessity of adopting a vigorous line of conduct. Jackson blamed Frederick William's indecisiveness on the conflicting opinions of the pro-French ministers and those ministers and military advisors who have feared the repercussions of, quote, allowing the French to establish themselves in the center of the Prussian dominions. Hanover reacted to the termination of Anglo-French negotiations with preparations for a French attack. On 12 May, Adolphus informed George III that he had received news of Whitworth's departure from Paris and assured the king to adopt all necessary measures to protect Hanover. Two days later, he updated his father on Hanoverian defense preparations, including the strengthening of key garrisons and the raising of troops to fill the regiments. He lauded, quote, the states of Kallenberg and Grubenhagen who were now assembled and who unanimously came forward and offered to do anything that was required of them for the defense of the country. Adolphus anticipated others to follow such an example, which enabled the Hanoverian army to, quote, prevent or at least check the hostile operations of the enemy. Jackson reported that Frederick William viewed, viewed Hanoverian actions with concern and anticipated a larger French army in response. Finally, on 31 May, Jackson provided London with news on pr the Prussian government's official decision that consisted of a Prussian offer to France that Hanover pay money to prevent the free se French seizure of the electorate. With intelligence reports placing the French army near the bishopric of, bishopric of Osnabrück, orders to the Hanoverian troops to retreat behind the Elbe to evacuate to England, and the Regency sending representatives to request that the French stop their march, he expected Prussia's appeal to arrive too late. Jackson provided uh, some more specifics on the events surrounding Prussia's decision. He blamed Frederick William's, quote, natural timidity, timidity counseled by the passive conduct of the Duke of Bruns Brunswick for obstructing Hogwitz's efforts to implement a plan. Information reached Jackson that Hogwitz had been forced to yield to the, to the influence of those who advocated for uh, less overt measures. And so Jackson remained unsure if, the, if Hogwitz was in, sincere in his advocacy to do something or not. Regarding Hanover, Jackson informed London that Baron Omtita received orders from Hanover requesting the Prussian government send a Prussian officer to mediate with the French on behalf of Hanover. Since Frederick William had decided on a policy of non-intervention, Hogwitz declined taking any steps. On 3 June 1803, the Hanoverian Regency surrendered to the French General Mortier. On hearing of Hanover's capitulation, Prince Adolphus departed for England. Meanwhile, in Berlin, Jackson, who still had not received any information from London, anticipated the loss of his standard communication lines with the impending likelihood of French control of the Elbe, Besser, and Hamburg. He hoped that the British ministry received the news that the French had advanced toward Hanover prior to the closure of the Elbe. Seemingly defeated, Jackson expressed his belief that nothing of substance existed for him to address on the inclinations of the Prussian government, only noting the general opinion in Berlin blamed Britain for depending, quote, too much upon the interest of Prussia to keep the French out of Germany. Francis Jackson's brother, George Jackson, was also with him in Berlin, and he recorded the, the distressing situation in Hanover. In particular, he, he commented that, quote, the lower classes who expressed loudly their discontent against the government 
console themselves with the hope that the French army will detach the electorate from England. So this, I think this event of the French invasion in 1803 indicates a, a disconnect of British policy in North German and a kind of an ignore, ignoring um, the cotton, continental reactions to Britain's insistence that Hanover is an independent country, despite the evidence. And that is all. Okay, thank you, Haley. Um, reminder, if you have any questions for our panelists, please put them into the chat to me, uh, and then I will read them off. Um, as we get started, I'm going to ask the first question. I want to go back to Chuck White and a little bit about the um, the, uh, the Scharnbergs and the, the artillery handbook. And, and really, it's the idea about doctrine. Um, this handbook seems to be a very tactical manual. Um, it's really looking at, do you, do you see starting of uh, what you can consider, what we would consider modern doctrine at this time period? Or is this still technically just entirely the technical aspects of it? Oh, it's, you're, you're right, Mark. It is kind of a doctrinal thing. He, the first two uh, chapters in, in book one deal with the theory of the artillery there. That's where he goes into the building concept. You know, he talks about how uh, gunnery is perfected through innovation and stuff. And he, and he basically talks about how it's not been done that much in the past. We, we don't train our artillery like we train the infantry and cavalry. He said, uh, in fact, he wrote that uh, in June of 1801, he just after he arrived there, he uh, participated in the, the first artillery uh, exercise there that, that when he was in Prussia. And all they cared about was whether the soldiers were dressed properly, whether their, their white uniform were thing and, and all this stuff. He said there, he wrote the mayor of fact, who was the colonel in chief of the artillery, saying there was no, why do you call this artillery? He said, because there was, we didn't fire a single cannon. We didn't even go through the gunnery techniques, you know. All we did was bring in these uh, soldiers here, th these artillerymen, and made sure they looked okay. They were dressed properly, they knew how to keep their uniform site, they knew close order drill and how to keep the barracks clean. But, you know, they're artillerymen. Where was the artillery? Nothing. And so he writes about all this stuff. And that's what Von der Ghost talks about because he cites a lot of this stuff from Scharnhorst's own writings. And, and he goes on throughout book one, talking about the theory and practice of gunnery and then how it can apply. And that's where book three comes in because he says, our choice is not even considered a part of a combined arms team. You know, we need to get the artillery in there involved in this, uh, you know, working with the cavalry and the infantry. And he said, basically, a Prussian formation is infantry in the center and cavalry on the flanks. He said, where's the artillery? You know, nowhere to be found. But you're right. It, 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 it is a doctrinal thing. He's trying to get people that talk. And that's where book three is a real doctrinal piece when he talks about putting theory in practice. And he has a lot of sketches on how to use artillery. Uh, and in fact, he wants um, Bruce Gudmanson in his book on the, uh, the 1918 artillery there references this. And he talks about how Scharnhorst one of this kind of rolling barrage. As the infantry is advancing, he wants to use the howitzers and other long range guns to pin down the enemy and, and keep them undercover so the infantry can close with and destroy them before they can fire back at them. There's a uh, question in the chat for you, Chuck, about uh, artillery, about Scharnhorst's concepts. Uh, were they implement, implemented before 1806? Um, and if so, was there any noticeable improvement that could be seen um, in 1806, 1807, despite Prussia, Prussia's horrible performance? No, they weren't implemented in 1806. You know, uh, it's like Peter Perret said, you know, Charnors was given the widest latitude to recommend stuff, but that's as far as it went. And Haley pointed that out when she's talking about Frederick William, uh, the third keeps hesitating and hesitating and uh, hesitating and 
and stuff. And I like what Friedrich Meinecke later says in his book on the German catastrophe, that people forget that this was his inheritance. Well, if that was his inheritance, what the heck was he doing? You know, the Treaty of Tilsit, he lost all of his territory to the west of the Elba. He lost half of Prussia. That's a great way to keep up your inheritance. You know, but uh, Napoleon had the best thing. Uh, it's in his letters from St. Helena, where he talks about at, at Tilsit there, where, uh, where Frederick the William III and Alexander were talking about how many buttons should be on the jacket and how they should be cut and everything else. And Napoleon, you're just sitting there, listen to these guys. He said, I knew nothing about being a tailor, but obviously these two monarchs were great tailors. And it's a good thing that tailors didn't fight the war because we would have lost and the Prussians would have won. All right, thank you. Uh, Ethan, I thought your paper was very interesting. Um, we tend to look at the land fair as this uh, top-down driven event in Prussia from the reforms of 1806 and, and the loss. Um, and yet you present a, a really different picture of this almost organically starting up in the East and, and this, uh, this fight of the different views of how it was gonna be. And uh, I, so I guess the question I would have is modern historians, um, why do we get it so wrong? Why do we kind of look at this as a national movement first instead of more organically coming up? Hmm. I think that that might be partly because we like, because a lot of historians tend to focus uh, for the Prussian period on the reform movement. So there's a um, national tendency to see to like to when you look at it from that lens, it looks like well the reformers wanted a land fair and a land fair was created and you see it from there. I think part of it might also be a sort of um, retroactive thing of German historians looking back from like the 1870s, 1880s and tracing the sort of growth of German nationalism from this point in the land fair as part of that. Um, and they're not entirely that's not necessarily entirely wrong on that. It's just that the the land and the reformers, like they lost that argument with the king in the end, right? The, 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 that those ideas were there. They just ended up losing. The land bear, best I can tell, was adopted because they needed soldiers, and where else are you going to get them? It was not a commitment to the idea. Okay, thank you. And Haley, I've got a question for you on yours. You had an interesting comment. Um, it was one about Great Britain basically ignoring or not being aware of the continental impacts of, of their policy. Could you expand on that a little bit? Or not caring because it's not part of their- Well, that could be a very course. true piece too. Um, this problem that I've seen, because there's been some research on this and there's the, pro the problem that I see here is the insistence that Britain, because they're very consistent in their messaging, right? And their messaging, their public messaging is this is a composite monarchy. They share a monarch, everything else is separate. Um, and throughout the 18th century, not even just, you see this culmination with Napoleon where things kind of fall apart for the British in that way, but they insist that they're separate um, and they maintain that so they do not have to defend this place. But of course they, they do depend on them for uh, troops and regiments and things like that. And there, in my opinion, from what I've looked at so far, if they give an inch on this idea that Hanover is in any way connected or beneficial to them, or that they're using it to leverage their own interest, if they give into that publicly in the messaging, um, that, that somehow they'll, they'll have to be responsible to, for defending it. Um, but it doesn't really work. I feel like this is a weakness in their strategy, in my opinion because they, they refuse to acknowledge it and ignore it and not actually deal with it. When no matter what the British do, the continent sees Hanover as part of the British system. Um, and I've read, I think, can't remember which story it was, he made a comment that when, when George I becomes George I of England and also elector of Hanover, that that disrupts the balance of power in Europe because it, it messes with the different dynamics. So the British refusing to acknowledge that um, means that they're not really assessing the entirety, I think, of their strategy. And they're not really assessing what the European powers are using that as and how they see it as. So if we, even though they see it as being part of 
of Britain, if that makes any sense. Okay, well, thank you very much. Uh, there's a question from Nicholas Kramer for Ethan. How successful was the Prussian leadership in forming land bear units? How hard was it to recruit the citizens for it? So they were, this question is kind of different if you're talking before the armistice and after the armistice. Before the armistice, they didn't, they weren't able to get very many land bear units trained and in the fields. There were a few, but not a lot. Uh, I don't have the exact numbers on me. Um, far more effective afterwards. There was not the, there was not like the great upswelling of patriotic enlistment that maybe the reformers would have hoped for. Uh, um, uh, the late Dr. Showalter has an article that goes over this where it was a lot of the enthusiasm in Prussia for the sort of national war effort is fairly concentrated in the um, sort of urban middle class, which is not particularly wide. So they were able to get significant numbers raised, but they had, I wouldn't exactly say like not resistance in the way that the French faced like outright armed resistance to conscription, but they did have a decent, they did have difficulty raising troops, especially in certain provinces. If I recall Silesia gave them, a, gave them particular problems. Um, so it was mixed. It, they did make, they did lay, raise the troops they needed and the land bear was, they couldn't field their armies, the armies they fielded without it, but they didn't get the sort of enthusiasm I think they were hoping for. Okay, thank you. We're almost out of time. So this will be the last question. Uh, and it's for Chuck and it's from Mike Legere. Um, Did Sharn Horse make any technical suggestions such as the weight of barrel and carriage, standardization of parts, caliber, those type of things? Any similarities with the Grieveball system? Yes, he did. You know, he wanted standardization of guns. I mean, he wrote several papers. Uh, one of them was on the strength in the artillery that he sent to the king where you'd have standardization of guns. These kind of guns go down to the company level. He even wanted like company guns within the battalions. Uh, he even thought about platoons, uh, having a small three, uh, three inch gun. Um, I forget what they're, you could hold some of them in your hands. And you know, they were lar about larger than a 50 caliber round that you could shoot at uh, there. And he, yeah, he recommended standardization of guns, parts, limbers. In fact, he did this when he was in Hanover. He cited the uh, Prussia, he wrote a letter, uh, the ball mode in there saying, we need to get our guns standardized like the Prussians have. And he cited how the Prussians have their limbers and everything well organized. They have charts in them where they put so much thing there, they have this. They even give their uh, riders their axes and picks and other things there, the guns. And then they also have separate holders for the horses. When he talks about, you know, because you got to train these horses. He said, when you fire the can, you got to have the horses there. Otherwise, they'll spook and run. Then what are you going to do? Yeah, Mike, that's, uh, they did have some of that. That's where the doctrinal piece comes in, where he talks about a lot of this stuff later on where his drawings are in there. And, and I was looking at uh, Kevin Kiley's book on uh, the Arturian Napoleonic era, and he has several of those drawings in there. All right, we are out of time, but I'm gonna do one more question that just came in from Todd Fisher for Ethan. Um, last question, how much was the promise of political reform used to inspire the formation of Land Bear? Uh, the men who joined that is. It was, so the king, if I'm recalling, definitely did promise a constitution, which doesn't get followed up on. Um, and that, I haven't done the research to like see how much that affected the individual soldiers. And I imagine that would change from province and region. Um, I, the impression I get from secondary sources is, uh, I don't know how big of a difference that made. Um, I'm, yeah, so I, my research has gone in a little bit of a different direction, so I'm not doing that, or I'm not actually sure how well you could do that with the destruction of some of the Prussian archives. So uh, I don't really know, but my guess is not too much. 
All right. Well, thank you. Um, all right. Well, thank you, everybody, for uh, participating, and thank you to our presenters. Uh, very interesting uh, uh, papers uh, that you uh, discussed today. Uh, for everyone out there, the next session uh, starts at 1.30 Eastern Time. Uh, we have lunch break now. Um, Alex, any other announcements for the good of the group? No, thank you so much. Wonderful presentations. Uh, and to the uh, attendees, uh, to the audience, go grab a snack, a lunch, and we'll see you in, in a bit.